Now we are in section number 16, the strengths of materials. Okay, so we discussed before actually the number of uh, the parameters relating to materials and their properties. Okay, normally the strength of a material is defined by the stress at which it fails. So, so therefore we want to know the, what is the maximum possible stress a material can support in a given application. Okay, so therefore we have to just uh, the understand uh, the fracture mechanics or failure modes of these materials. Right, therefore we should have a way to recognize the failure of a material. So as we discussed before even, so we, we assume that in most of the times uh, when the material has plastically deformed, okay, we assume that this has already been failed. It is not usable anymore. Therefore, when some material has exceeded its yield stress, sigma y, we assume that material has already been failed and therefore we can't use it anymore. So as we discussed in previous uh, the, the slides, okay, so normally for most of the structural applications, uh, we want to have some elastic response and we don't want any material to operate in this region. Okay, so therefore after the yield stress or after this point, so we assume that material has failed. So let's look at some examples of a real failure of materials actually. So this is a failure of a bridge. It's a really dangerous failure of a bridge. And you can see that these metal bars or these beams, okay, so they have not uh, completely failed or broken into two or so. So they have deformed. Therefore, the, this, this material, although it is just it still as a one piece, it is not usable anymore. It has exceeded its uh, the yield stress, and then this therefore, so this has already failed, right? Also, this is another famous example. If you can recognize, this is the Takuma Bridge, uh, which was in Japan actually. I think this was built in uh, the 1960s, as I remember. Okay, but this bridge was collapsed uh, after a few years of construction, right? Uh, th this was a, a really famous picture. So this, uh, this picture was taken during the, the, the failure of the bridge. So if the, some of the main reasons behind the failure of this bridge uh, was the resonance and also some aeroacoustic effects, right? If you have not heard this word resonance, it is a really important word. It's related to the vibration of a material. Okay, so for, for each and every object or a material, you define something called natural frequency. So that is the maximum possible frequency a material can vibrate. Uh, vibrate with okay sometimes you might have seen some videos some violin players or guitarists uh, playing uh, their instruments uh, to shatter some wine glasses okay so they don't touch or do anything to the glass but uh, they just play in the instrument therefore they can play the instrument to shatter the uh, the, the wine glass so what is happening over there so they, they try to match the natural frequencies of these objects okay so they try to uh, play their instrument to match with the natural frequency of this wine glass. So therefore, the both of, if, if they can match the natural frequency of this wine glass, it will start to the resonate uh, with the with the violin, uh, with the sound of the violin or with the sound of the guitar. So okay, then normally glasses are just brittle materials. If this uh, the vibration uh, can exceed the fracture for this particular the, the glass. So then they will shatter. So that is what happening with the resonance. Okay. Therefore, the failure of this bridge was well noted failure in the engineering history. And then uh, the reason was uh, the resonance and also some aeroacoustic effects. And then, and uh, several other, if you would like to read around. And also, this is another failure. Okay. Uh, the, the, this is a rail track. You can see normally rail tracks are just having slight bends, but not like this actually. So I hope you don't need to travel along this track. Okay, this track has a permanent deformation, therefore it is not usable anymore. Okay, so therefore we assume that the most of the applications, when material exceeds the yield stress or the yield point, they are not usable anymore. Or otherwise, so there's another constraint or there's another criteria that we can look at is the fracture stress. Okay, so we can assume that material has failed when it is fractured. Okay, the, the, the reason why we have to discuss the fracture stress is that some particular materials just not deform before the fracture, like ceramics and glasses. They just shatter, okay, without showing any permanent deformation. So therefore, we can't just work with yield stress, right? Or maybe the fracture stress is less than the yield stress. Therefore, we have to discuss the fracture stress as well. So the fracture stress is the stress related to the failure of the material. So this, this line is related to the fracture stress, this point. Okay, we just define by sigma star here for this unit. Right? So therefore, when we consider the failure of a material or strength of a material, yield stress and fracture stress are two important uh, the parameters. Okay? So uh, depending on the material type, 
or the application type. So we have to consider which one is the related parameter, fracture stress or oil distress, right? So let's consider ceramic materials. The normally ceramic materials tend to have very high values of sigma y, oil distress values, okay? So they just fail without showing any uh, the plastic deformation or permanent deformation, right? So they are, therefore the fracture stress for ceramics should be less than the yield stress. Okay, so without before deforming plastically, so they fracture like this. Okay, so then we can assume that for the ceramic materials, the sigma y is really greater. Okay, they are having very high sigma y values or the yield stress values, and the, the, and also the fracture stress is less than the yield stress. That is why uh, ceramic materials normally the the shatter without showing any. Uh, the plastic deformation uh, uh, before the fracture. Actually, the strength of ceramic materials are generally limited by their resistance to crack propagation to them. Okay, so uh, we discussed some uh, the, the mechanisms of uh, the plastic and elastic deformation of these materials, right? So, but for the ceramics, okay, ceramics tend to fracture before plastic deforming. So therefore for the ceramics, the important parameter is the, the fracture stress, not the yield stress because the yield stress is really high. And then before reaching the yield stress, uh, they will fail at the fracture stress, right? So please, you can add this line into a page 96. You can, you can recognize the location. We have just uh, the, uh, the provided some spaces along the lecture notes. So normally the, the red text here, so you can add those text into a lecture notes to make it complete. But when we discuss the strength of a metal, the important parameter is the yield stress or yield strength, okay? For most of engineering metals, yield strength or yield stress is less than the fracture stress. So as we just discussed in this curve here now, so this is the stress strain curve for a metal material. You can see that now fracture stress is uh, slightly higher than the yield stress. So that means metal will just uh, the deform before the fracture, right? So then you can add this, uh, the less than sign, the sigma y should be less than the fracture stress in most of the cases, okay? For most of the engineering metals, sigma y is less than fracture stress, and hence the strength of most of the metals is determined by the resistance of the metal to dislocation motion. We discussed the dislocation motion before, okay, for the metals, right, okay, so therefore you can add in the page 96 again in the related place, metals tend to deform plastically before fracturing. So, however, we have discussed both actually, the yield stress and the fracture stress, of course, so some applications, we don't want to have plastic deformations or permanent deformations. So therefore, sigma y is the maximum possible stress for that particular material. But sometimes uh, we can consider fracture stress is the maximum possible stress uh, or maybe sometimes ultimate tensile stress as well. Right. And also the one thing you have to note here, uh, the although we discuss these different parameters for the materials, okay, so materials behave differently based on their environment. So therefore we can change the behavior of materials by changing the environment, their operating conditions, okay? So for example here, now you can see a metal here, right? So this is at 80 Kelvin and this is at 300 Kelvin. So this is uh, roughly at uh, the room temperature, okay? This is somewhere in freezing cold, 80 Kelvin. You can observe the failure surfaces here. It's like a brittle fracture. And we, we can't observe any deformation in these fracture surfaces, okay? So at, at 80 Kelvin, uh, the, is, is really cold temperature. And then here it's a ductile fracture. You can see at room temperature, the same material behave as a ductile material. We can see some, uh, the deformation before the fracture, uh, uh, some deformation uh, of this workpiece uh, at this high temperature. Therefore, we can understand that the materials can behave differently depending on their working environment, operating conditions, okay? So especially the temperature is really important. We should understand that the, all the parameters we normally discuss, like heat capacity, thermal conductivity, viscosity, density, uh, all of these parameters are dependent upon the temperature. Okay, so normally we provide some certain density for a particular material, for, but that value is normally at the room temperature. If you change the temperature, so these parameters normally will change. Okay, the thermal conductivity is also the same. They will change with the temperature, right? So if you get an example, like some metals, okay, we can convert them into superconductors when we cool it down. Uh, for example, uh, some metals, like, some metals like uh, the lead and uh, the zinc will achieve superconductivity when we when we cool it down uh, to somewhere around minus two hundred seventy three degrees. Okay, 
And but some other copper based alloys will turn into superconductors when we when we just heat them up into very high temperatures. So therefore, you can understand now. So it is just really important uh, to understand the behavior of material depending on the temperature and pressure, the working temperature and working pressure. Okay, operating environment and the material properties are related. So therefore, you have to match those properties, and you you should have very good understanding to avoid some possible catastrophic failures during the during the use of those structures or materials. Right, that is really important. And the on the other hand, actually properties of materials or the components or machines or whatever we can change the change their properties based on the manufacturing technique as well. Right. So therefore, based on the properties required, we have to change the manufacturing technique. Right. So here you can see a bit brittle material. Okay, and this is a ductile material, so they behave differently. Right. If, let's say we just have a solid metal metal piece, and then we want to process it uh, by making it hot. Okay, we form into different shape or the required shape that we need, and then sometimes uh, sometimes we drop that metal into the water for rapid cooling. Okay, and sometimes we keep it in the normal uh, normal atmospheric air to have a slow cooling. So depending on the fast cooling rate or slow cooling rates, the crystallization behavior of the material is going to be different. So therefore, the properties of that material or the workpiece also be different depending on the manufacturing technique. Okay, so that is also really important. You have to select the proper manufacturing techniques, and then uh, based on that, we will have to decide or we can achieve the desired properties, right? So in most of the applications like metal processing, we just use some techniques, uh, the the heat treatment te technologies uh, to achieve the desired properties from particular material or particular work uh, from from a particular component. Right, so this is another example of how we can just use manufacturing technique to achieve the desired properties. It is a concrete actually. So you could see normally the concretes are normally brittle materials, although we have some uh, metal rods inside uh, to get some uh, tensile properties. Right, but let's say we don't have metals inside. So then concrete is just having cement, uh, some sand uh, and also some gravel. So they are really brittle. So, but how we can turn that into a ductile material or ductile concrete? So we can add some reinforcements like polymers maybe, or maybe we can add some other uh, possible reinforcement to depending on the required properties. Sometimes we can add some graphene to achieve thermal conductivity in some applications, or we can add some fibers. Uh, in com we can make a composite. If you want some properties only in one direction, like tensile properties, we can provide fibers only in one direction, or maybe in multiple direction. Based on that, we can achieve isotropic or anisotropic properties from a material. In techniques and operating environment are really important to get the desired properties from a material or from a component. So, right. So then the fracture, the, the section 17 in your lecture notes, the fracture is also a really important thing to be considered. Okay, it doesn't matter whatever the component, a material or structure or device. Okay, so uh, if, we, if we can understand uh, the possible modes of fracture or how they can fail, so it is really important uh, for the safety concerns. Okay. If we can understand the possible failure modes of some given component, let's say an aircraft wing, or maybe a crane, or maybe simple uh, the machine tool. So if we can understand how they can fail, or what are the failure modes, or they're going to have a crack, or they're going to have a catastrophic failure without, without giving any indications. So therefore, fracture mechanics is really important. Uh, so if we know the failure modes for a given material, so we can have some uh, the uh, precautions to avoid some catastrophic failures. That is the most important thing. Okay, for example, here you now this, uh, this is a picture showing a failed, uh, the uh, rudder of an aircraft. Okay, so if we knew that, how it is going to fail in most of the cases, so then we could have just uh, the added some kind of the safety measures to avoid those possible failure modes or to delay those uh, the uh, failure modes or failures. That is why we, we have to learn fracture mechanics. Uh, in material science and material engineering, fracture mechanics is one of the important parts when we use materials. It's not only manufacturing and the material properties are important. The mode of fracture is also really important as well. Therefore, we have to do testing when, for example, let's say we're going to manufacture new aircraft wing. And then before just uh, uh, take that into uh, the practical use, we have to understand what are the possible failure modes for that particular wing. Okay, what will happen when we just run this at normal operating conditions or an aircraft engine? So when you manufacture a new engine, so we have to test it in a number of ways. 
to check whether it is safe enough to uh, the or it, whether it whether it can cope with the normal operating environment. Okay, if it is not, so we have to improve it, right? So here we have some interesting videos showing some of the tests uh, done in some applications. This is this is a static ground testing of an aircraft uh, wing. of the very first uh, H350 aircraft ever built. In fact, this is more a present since uh, we will torture it uh, a lot of times, in particular before the first flight. We have in front of us more than 2,500 tons of steel. This is the cage of the bird that we have in front of us. What is planned in this test campaign is to load the specimen mechanically and also to pressurize it. We will go to the extremes to check the structural behavior of the bird. So we will pull upward the wing, pull downward, pull the fuselage in all the critical situations. We have installed 12,000 sensors on the specimen. So you can imagine between the offloading position of the wing, when we compensate simply the weight of the bird, and the max level of load, we have more than 5.2 meters displacement. Climb into the installation. The red pipes here are inlets where we are pressurizing the fuselage. So we have dummy windows, we have installed that, and the big pipes are connected to a music instrument that we call clarinet. Not to play music really, but just to pressurize and uh, to torture the aircraft. Imagine the aircraft uh, will be pressurized uh, in a worse manner than if it would be in space. More than 1.3 bars. It's like a bomb. If ever a cargo door is opening, uh, we can damage the complete building uh, to detrimental effect. We are re preparing the very last loading case uh, that we plan to perform for the first flight. So it's really uh, the result of five years' efforts of the team and the uh, day of the first flight will be uh, the communion and the celebration. My little contribution will be uh, the opening of the flight envelope for the structural part. Okay, so you saw that here, the wing was just trying to uh, the, uh, the test for 5.2 meters vertical displacement at the uh, at the at the edge of the wing. Okay, so that is a, they, they are doing so many tests, and they said that they have 12,000 sensors installed on the specimen. All right, so this is a, one of the tests uh, they did on uh, the aircraft A350, uh, the wings as they manufactured the first time. Right, so this is another interesting video uh, for an engine test carried out for an aircraft. So that also has multiple testing conditions uh, to check whether they can cope with the operating environment. Recently, Boeing completed the first flight of the GE-90-115B powered 777-300ER aircraft. The GE-90-115B engine was developed by GE Aircraft Engines exclusively for the 777-300ER. The GE-90-115B engine delivers 115,000 pounds of takeoff thrust to the 300ER and represents the highest thrust jet engine in aviation history. Key certification testing was conducted at GE Aircraft Engines Outdoor Test Facility, located near Peebles, Ohio. I'm doing 37, begin icy cloud. Nine fifty three thirty four on point. 
continue to have time for 30 seconds. We'll turn on water flow at 1100 GPM. Water on. There's 063748, first to take off. This is what we call the chicken test. And then they throw in some meats into the aircraft engine to check uh, the, the capability of just, just in case if some birds are just uh, traveling through the aircraft engine for some reason. Of course, the birds could be like uh, the suck into the engine near the airports. Uh, so normally it could happen. Time is 2357. We'll start change at 5146. I accelerate triple red line. I accel now. Time is 0001. On point, triple red line. Take ADS 187, engine log 211. Fan 2617, core. 11,321, EGT, 2013. Boeing and GE aircraft engines, developing products that reduce the size of the world with safety, comfort, and reliability. Okay, if you want to have the video links, you can find them uh, at the bottom of the slide, okay?